Hello, welcome to Am I Neurodivergent? This is chapter 37 of 52, recapping my discovery year after realising I was neurodivergent from a complete stand and start in my 40s and trying to understand what that all meant in terms of <clears throat> getting going again uh, with my life as a kind of new me after a major burnout and stress breakdown. That restart has definitely been a bit of a struggle at times. Uh, to recap, if anyone's coming to these videos new, I got my autism diagnosis a couple of years ago in 2022, my ADHD diagnosis last year in 2023, which means I'm what's known as ADHD, co-occurring autism and ADHD, which can clash into and contradict each other and be in many ways harder to spot than just one condition or the other though in other ways harder to deal with and manage because it can make the way you react to things really unpredictable from one day to the next. Looking back at week 37 into my discovery year, I was wrapping up learning about, or at least trying to learn more about, my ADHD aspects in particular through the Future Learn website and King's College London's four-week Understanding ADHD course, which I've been recapping over these last few chapters using my course notes from the time, um, sometimes to great frustration over the rather ableist medical model language being used and strong preference given to the voice of clinicians and academics quote-unquote treating and dealing with ADHD rather than the lived experiences of smart, capable people living with ADHD and trying to manage and adapt their skill set and cognitive differences to a world set up for neurotypical people and the heavy toll that can take on ADHDers trying to get by. The fourth and final week of the Understanding ADHD course focuses on ADHD treatment and management and I've got to be honest, I felt a little uneasy before looking through my course notes on the way they were going to approach and frame this but as much as the ADHD side of me says screw this do something else the autistic bit of me needs to try to finish something I've started and this time the autistic side of me is winning that ongoing battle so we're going to crack on and try to wind up this mini series of ADHD specific videos so ADHD treatment and management Stimulant medication is the most common treatment for ADHD, or rather the combination of pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical treatment. Um, I should acknowledge straight off the bat that a lot of ADHDers can be anti-meds, and talking about meds at all in neurodivergent spaces can be, really, can be a really tricky balance, and obviously this course, looking back on it, has been coming from a starting point of the medical model rather than the social model which has at times been jarring and I think why I've been struggling a bit with it. Um, <clears throat> right, I'm immediately going to go off script and away from my course notes because I don't, I don't even think I've ever talked about the different models of addressing differences slash disabilities in these videos, whether those differences are cognitive, uh, neurological, or physical. So sidebar, and then back to the course. Basically, there are three acknowledged models of approaching differences. One, the medical model views disability, and yes, neurodivergence is very much viewed as a disability under the medical model, as a personal medical problem to be fixed or treated by healthcare professionals. The medical model focuses almost entirely on an individual's impairment or condition <clears throat> and sees it as the root cause of limitations and barriers to that individual's participation in society. Medical interventions and therapy are the answers to quote-unquote fix people using the medical model. And for a long time, this is how neurodivergence has been viewed and still is in many quarters, unfortunately. More recently, though, the limitations of the medical model have become more and more apparent, particularly in terms of neurodivergence and just how common we're realising it is. Like one in seven people are estimated to be neurodivergent in some way. Uh, remember, there's like there's millions and millions of us. So quote unquote fixing millions and millions of individual people through pills and therapy rather than 
taking control of the wheel and addressing broader systemic barriers and limitations across the entire setup of society that stop all members of that society thriving is like a, maybe not the best or most sustainable long-term approach to this stuff. Um, so that brings us on to number two, the social model. So this approach views disabilities and differences not as faults or discrepancies wherever individuals differ from what's seen as normal, but through those existing barriers and limitations in society that often prevent people who differ from the norm fully participating on an equal basis with other people in society. And by barriers, we're talking everything from physical obstacles, discrimination, unconscious biases, lack of accessibility, and broader social attitudes towards differences. The social model emphasizes the need to sequentially remove these barriers and limitations and simply create more inclusive and accessible environments across the whole of society so everyone can flourish and focus on thriving, not just surviving, which is the dream, right? A key part of the social model is also around empowering individuals with differences to advocate for their rights and challenge the societal norms and structures that perpetuate that ongoing inequality. And it's the social model that has been increasingly embraced by neurodivergent advocates in recent years. And that makes some of the attitudes on courses like this one that I took, as well-meaning as it no doubt was and is, seem quite rapidly out of date already, just a, just a few years down the line. Um, <clears throat> there's also a third model, a third approach, sometimes called the combined model or the biopsychosocial model, which places differences and disabilities as a complex interaction between biological, psychological and social factors. It's a holistic approach that pulls in not just an individual's condition or generic perceived societal barriers, but individual people's specific emotional well-being and social environment and personal experiences, emphasising the need to address all aspects of a person's individual life in order to support their well-being and inclusion in society. Individual plus environment equals outcome, basically, yet again. Neurodivergence plus environment equals outcome. ADHD plus environment equals outcome. And this third approach is obviously the right one, the right end point in an ideal world, because it addresses both factors, both the individual and the individual's interactions with society in a holistic way. But we're such such a long way from that still, particularly when courses like this still primarily communicate in quite a patronising, judgmental way, using primarily the medical model. That I understand why a lot of neurodivergent Advocates just push and push the social model and scream that society has to change and accommodate us better. And I've definitely gone through a bit of this too, including I think in some of the earlier videos in this series. But as ever, with so much of life, it's the third combined, more difficult path that's almost certainly the right one. And equally, that third path's always the harder one to go down than the easier black or white options. It's that. I don't, want to, I don't want to get too pretentious. I've talked about the Hegelian dialectic before. It's a remnant of my pretentious philosophy student days that stuck with me, where you have a thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, wherein contradictions and conflicts between ideas and beliefs ultimately combine and lead to a higher level of understanding and truth through a combination of both. So proactive philosophical pragmatism, basically, is how I'd define it. The, the process of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis is unpicking contradictions and conflicts to get to underlying principles and arrive at a more comprehensive and nuanced understanding of how to approach and solve sometimes intractable-looking problems. It's, it's almost always the way to solving things, but it's it's hard. Um, anyway, oh, that was a, a big diversion from my course notes, uh, all by way of saying, again, that this course really, 
leans almost exclusively towards the medical model, and that can be quite frustrating. Um, I got really agitated about this when I did my video of, I think, week two of this course, but it is what it is, um, and there's definitely still useful information to be gleaned here in terms of adults going through a late in life discovery that they're ADHDers and have been all along, which is the point for me. But I think... I think it was a learning about ADHD from this course that almost made me feel as if my ADHD was more insurmountable than my autism, looking back. So it, it really is damaging just presenting ADHD over and over and over again as a deficit or an abnormality. And I will continue to call that out because around 15 to 20% of the population are estimated to be neurodivergent. And 15 to 20% of a population, genes that keep getting replicated, let us not forget, is not an abnormality. It's a natural variance, plain and simple. If some, <clears throat> if some privileged white person, a person like me, for example, came out and said African people, who also coincidentally make up around 15 to 20 percent of the world's population, are not exactly like me and must therefore be a quote-unquote genetic abnormality, but that there are ways of treating that genetic abnormality, they'd quite rightly be called out as a horrible racist and a horrendous human, completely blind to human diversity and variance. But clinicians and academics talk about neurodivergent people and cognitive differences in these exact terms, whatever an individual's colour, creed, religion or gender, in 2024. Stop trying exclusively to fix us, just work with us, to make society more inclusive for all brains. We'll do a lot better together, I promise. Um, right, I keep ranting. I genuinely am going to focus on the course notes um, for week four now. So, right, back to five minutes ago, or whatever. <clears throat> A com yeah, a combination of stimulant medication and non-pharmaceutical treatment tends to be the most common quote-unquote treatment for ADHD. Stimulant medication seems to work for about 70% of ADHDers. It's often seen as quite counterintuitive to give hyperactive kids, for example, stimulant medication. But the gist of the science behind it is that ADHDers tend to have regions of the brain which are underactive and that accordingly stop them from applying the brakes in those areas, basically keeping their brain thoughts and often bodies going at 100 miles an hour and eventually leading to exhaustion and burnout. Stimulant medication activates the braking system in those underactive parts of an ADHD brain and allows, in theory, more control and agency over out-of-control thoughts. So it's not the same at all as quote-unquote sedating hyperactive kids, which medicating ADHD kids is often dismissed as, unless you over-prescribe with too high a dose, obviously, which can and does happen too. That's why there's what's called a titration period with meds, experimenting with doses to find the right dose for an individual, because when you get it right, stimulant meds enhance the function of an ADHD brain, giving you more control and regulation over yourself, not just suppressing that or zombifying you if you're hyper. In the best of cases, meds can lead to more emotional regulation and more self-control. But even in the 70% of ADHDers that stimulant medication demonstrably works for, and sadly I don't think I'm one of that 70%, but I can go through my own meds experience another time, behavioural and or environmental interventions are also seen as a key to feeling like you can cope. This is what's known as a multimodal approach and looks first and foremost at the environment of the person with ADHD, whether child, adolescent or adult, and what the particular challenges in that environment are. Because if you can adapt the environment to enable getting the best out of the individual, often that's enough, particularly if the core underlying ADHD symptoms are less severe. But when the ADHD symptoms are more severe and there are core ongoing challenges involving inattention, hyperactivity or impulsivity interfering with and causing problems in the individual's life and their experience and enjoyment of it, 
than medication in the view of the chorus. And I tend to agree, which, again, I'll get to. Medication should at least be considered. Stimulant meds take about half an hour to an hour to kick in, depending on whether they're fast release or slow release, and address core symptoms of ADHD over a period of around four to eight hours. Uh, users generally seeing and feeling notable reductions in mind wandering and having the ability to focus more and being less distracted, feeling less restless, feeling less impatient, feeling more able to quote unquote do things, which can clearly bring great benefits across education, work and social settings, basically across every aspect of someone's life. Again, this particular course tends to focus more on behavioural interventions and cognitive tips and training for sustaining attention in kids getting ADHD diagnosis and getting the best out of ADHD kids in the classroom rather than late diagnosed adults in work settings, for example. But the, the principles are broadly the same. I'll just briefly... I personally really struggled after getting a formal ADHD diagnosis last year with the decision whether I wanted to take meds or not. As much as my brain has massively frustrated me over the years, um, and it has, I basically like it. I like the weird creative thoughts it has and flights of fancy it goes on. and was absolutely terrified of altering my brain chemistry or changing my brain in some way by taking meds. <clears throat> I'd also heard stories about ADHDers taking ADHD meds where when meds were taken, it suppressed those ADHD traits, which then subsequently made an individual's autistic traits more prevalent. It disrupted the balance, basically the uneasy alliance that the two conditions had learned to build up with each other. And as much as I wanted to change myself to feel I could cope better, hello, ADHD, I also feared that change and feeling different to how I had been feeling, and um, hello, autism. So, as with everything ADHD, you end up stuck and in two minds and unable to make a decision because all options seem both right and wrong to you. ADHD is, is super fun. Um, but anyway, this video is just supposed to be on ADHD. I'm really struggling to stay on topic <clears throat> on these ADHD videos. Way more than when I was talking about just autism in the earlier videos. I've got no idea if that's a psychological thing, like because I'm talking more about distractibility, therefore I'm more distractible, or if my mind's just a bit more fragmented at the moment anyway. But anyway, right, complete focus on course notes from here on in. Benefits of ADHD medication, according to Professor Philip Asherson, within 30 to 60 minutes of taking stimulant medication, ADHDers will likely feel less restless, more patient, better able to sit and focus, better able to plan and organise their day, be less distracted and feel more able to complete tasks, be more likely to feel calm and more likely to feel stable, both in mood and emotions. Stimulant meds increase dopamine and noradrenaline neurotransmitter levels, and um, dopamine levels, to recap a past video, uh, help regulate motivation, learning, decision-making, experiencing reward and pleasure. Noradrenaline levels help regulate our response to perceive stress or danger, our blood pressure, heart rate, fight or flight response, as well as, as mood regulation and alertness. So ADHDers have naturally lower levels of these self-regulating neurotransmitters. And what stimulant meds do is block the dopamine and noradrenaline transporters, which stops our lower levels of them getting gobbled up too quickly and consequently leads to an increased availability of the two, which over a short period leads to enhanced function in the brain regions involved with all those good things like control, regulation of activity and attention reduction of excessive and uncontrolled mind wandering, restlessness, overactivity and emotional dysregulation. 
A lot of ADHDers are quite surprised to find that their inability to complete tasks and get things done, whether at work or at home, are due to lack of emotional regulation as much as anything else, which meds can help with by getting you out of that fight or flight panic mode and reducing anxiety and, and allowing your brain to actually focus on doing a task at hand rather than feeling stressed out or overwhelmed or attacked by it, if that makes sense. But the effects of the stimulant medication wear off as the day goes on. You go back to normal again, or at least whatever normal broadly looks like for you. Stimulant meds, in addition to non-pharmaceutical strategies like cognitive behavioral therapy, can mitigate that roller coaster ride of focus and non-focus by introducing lifestyle changes and coping mechanisms for promoting better adaptive skills to improve functioning in daily life or equally cope better with issues that have emerged as a result of not coping over time such as anxiety and low self-esteem. <clears throat> Mindfulness based interventions can lead to considerable reductions in ADHD based anxiety and overthinking but I can say from personal experience that mindfulness can also be really difficult for ADHDers to adapt to and not feel frustrated with. This is something I've kind of dipped my toes into and I'm really interested in doing more of as I try to get better in particular from this burnout period I've, I've recently been in because the efficacy of stimulant meds will eventually decline over time as your brain develops tolerance to the drugs. So stimulant meds are definitely a short to medium term solution to help you get your shit together if you're struggling, basically, is my broad conclusion to all this. But lifestyle changes, self-management and mindfulness are almost more useful over the longer term in learning to manage your emotional responses to stressful situations. And as I mentioned, I know a lot of people in the neurodivergent community can be anti-meds and think your brain is your brain, embrace and celebrate it, don't try to change it. But I think the truth as usual, is probably somewhere in between. Self-management, autonomy and agency over yourself is the dream, clearly, but meds can definitely help as a short to medium term crutch to help you get to that point with yourself, particularly if you've got yourself somewhat into crisis or burnout mode and need a little help getting yourself out of it. And even just reflecting on all that for this video, I'd stopped taken meds after a period of doing so, fell back in pretty, fell back into pretty bad crisis and burnout mode again over these last few months in all honesty. And I think I'm going to start up on mine again. So as hard as it's been to try to get back into doing these videos, it's actually maybe quite timely that I've pushed myself to do this video and refresh myself on some of this stuff for me, <clears throat> if nothing else. Anyway, the course also talks a little bit about possible side effects of stimulant medication too, like appetite loss and sleep problems and sometimes high blood pressure. <clears throat> I definitely had a bit of insomnia when I first tried taking meds, like racing thoughts and my brain audibly roaring lying in bed at night, but I kind of mitigated that by taking them earlier in the day. So the, the come down back to my quote unquote normal, i.e. unfocused and anxious and racing mind, wasn't happening just around bedtime and keeping me up and awake and insomniac and all over the place, readjusting myself. Other side effects can be the opposite, that people can feel too calmed down and almost zombified by it. They miss their racing thoughts because they've become so used to them, particularly with late diagnosed. And this can sometimes happen if the dose is too high or the type of medication isn't the right one for you. That's why good healthcare providers will go through that titration period with you and monitor how you feel on different types and doses of meds to find which works best for you as an individual. Um, don't trust providers that just give you meds and hope for the best without a titration period or follow up with you and um, do do experiment with this stuff <clears throat> the course modules also talk a bit about 
other non-pharmaceutical interventions like cognitive training, neurofeedback, and brain stimulation. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, A, because I don't know enough, B, because again, it's more about ADHD kids and how malleable their brains are when they're still developing. And C, it makes me slightly uncomfortable for some reason, slightly gives me the ick, and until I can work out why, I don't really want to linger around it all too much. I'm sure it's all potentially really good and advantageous in certain circumstances. Um, at its heart, it's basically just more scientifically and medically inclined brain training, the same as CBT or, or mindfulness is on a more personal level. But I just don't feel qualified or ready to pile into all that side of things at this stage and proffer up an opinion on <clears throat> neuroplasticity and actively looking to change a brain structure, so I'm not I'm not going to. I might come back to it in due course once I've had the chance to look into it all in a lot more detail and read a range of views and opinions. But my gut instinct is again just stop trying to cure us and correct us. And um, cognitive diversity is a good thing, but I'm not outright condemning approaches like this either if it helps people feel more in control of themselves. I'm just taking a pass on it for now until I know and understand more. Uh, what else? The next modules are on classroom management and how teachers can do more to help ADHD kids understand that their differences and focus challenges are not their fault, which is good, obviously. But again, this channel, my channel, is primarily for adults realizing they're neurodivergent later in life. So I'm not going to dwell too much on the more kid-focused classroom aspects, like giving ADHD kids more feeling of agency and autonomy over themselves. As interesting as it is, if anyone watching this is super interested, the course link is in the, the video description. Feel free to sign up and absorb all the aspects that are more relevant to your own individual circumstances and interests than, than mine. But I'm all for teacher training and blended approach to classrooms. Bring it on and I like the less medical model aspect of this. I appreciate its inclusion. If only workplaces were this progressive with different skills and strengths and approaches. I already talked about a couple of videos ago how hyperactivity and impulsiveness tend to decrease as ADHD kids become adults, but inattention traits and challenges remain core and constant th throughout life, from childhood into adolescence, right into the, the minefield of, of adulting. Finally, we get a bit more to close out the modules from Catherine, the late diagnosed ADHD woman the course has used as their token actual lived experience of ADHD voice. And again, she talks a lot of sense using the term ADHD management to correct their use of ADHD treatment. So well done her fighting the good uphill fight. She does say for her that medication definitely works. She's one of the 70% it does work for, but that is not the whole story, and a holistic approach is the right approach to finding what works for you as an individual. She also talks about since getting a late adult diagnosis, she went through the process of unlearning a lot of the damaging behaviours she'd learned over time, and the low self-esteem she'd developed trying to <clears throat> force herself into living in the confines of boxes that just weren't the right boxes for her. And I did, and I'm sure a lot of us will recognise that assessment. She says talking therapy has been key for her in starting to get better, and I would agree with that. I have to say, I only recently found out, having paid quite a lot of money for therapy for much of my own first two years post-diagnosis, that talking therapy is actually provided through your GP on the NHS and many local authorities. So do try to push for talking therapy through your GP before breaking your piggy bank irretrievably. I feel quite stupid now about having spent so much money before realizing that. When you've spent when you've spent so long masking until you can't anymore, like what happened with me, and you've not been used to asking for help until you kind of break a little bit, you often don't know how to ask for help or where to ask for help. And I've learned belatedly that your GP 
can be a very useful first port of call, but that's not an easy relationship for a lot of people getting a late diagnosis when the healthcare system didn't spot you for decades. The trust in that system may well have gone a bit as it had for me. Hence why I went private and spent a ton of money, um, potentially unnecessarily. But there we go. Anyway, uh, Catherine talks. And I find this actually quite emotional to listen to at the time about wishing so much that she'd been on medication as a child that most adults with ADHD she's met have a sense of underachievement, either professionally or academically, or in terms of their personal lives, that they haven't reached their optimum level of achievement somehow. <clears throat> They've fallen short of what they somehow knew they were capable of. That's a real struggle to get past with a late diagnosis, and I've still been struggling with it quite badly just recently, two years on from my late diagnosis. That kind of wishing you'd known sooner, or having wasted your life a little bit, tilting at windmills. Anyway, no matter how you might be feeling with a late diagnosis, it's never too late. It's, it's hard not to look back, and I've really struggled with this, but all you can do is look forward. It's all just about learning to love yourself again, and this is, this is part Catherine and, and part me, but just learning to put yourself and your mental health first, and to relearn to feel proud of who you are, not to feel ashamed of your perceived shortcomings. Just work with yourself, understand yourself, and experiment with strategies to be your best self and get the best out of yourself. Also remember that you know yourself best. You can take advice and pick up tips and treat what others do as a kind of shopping list of options, I guess, but Always remember that no one knows you as well as you know you and that you're ultimately in control of learning and thinking about what works for you and putting those systems and boundaries in place to be the best you that you can be without apology and without over worrying about letting other people down or people pleasing or meeting other people's expectations of you. Put self care first and chase the things you want for yourself with love and kindness for yourself. And if those things you chase don't feel right, then course correct and, and find what it is you are looking for. Finding the real you is iterative, so don't worry about getting it wrong before you get it right. That's also a hard lesson to learn, when you can be all or nothing, a perfectionist or a nothingist, and, and whatever that is that you wanna chase for yourself, Feel like and believe that you deserve it and that you're good enough, because you are. But finally, just on treatment as well as management to conclude and reiterate, I genuinely believe, although it hasn't necessarily worked for me, and agree that taking ADHD meds to help you through tough times and help you get your wheels pointing in the right direction again is nothing to feel ashamed of, or that you're letting your tribe down by taking meds or anything like that. Getting help is okay. Getting help is fine when, while you build your armor back up. And you may fall over a few times while you do it, and that's, that's okay too. When you can swing for the sky on your own with the systems you've built up for yourself, you will. You'll know when you feel able to do that and learn not to beat yourself up when you don't. Anyway, um, done. Thanks for watching, and uh, yep, hopefully see you again. Cheers.